Hello everyone, this lesson is going to be on DNA replication. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit different in terms of the format compared to other ones that I put together. Other ones I've been using notebook, this one is going to be in a PowerPoint. And so we'll kind of see how it goes with this one. Um, I'm also going to have a few animations that I can play for you now that it's in PowerPoint. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like you're going to hear the narration. So even though we'll see the animation, you're going to have to put up with me going through the um, narration. So with uh, DNA replication, what we're really talking about is a duplication of the DNA. So why don't we just kind of go back here, first of all, and do a little bit of a review of cell cycles. So remember that the cell cycle, just kind of dividing it into high wedges here. With the cell cycle, what we're talking about is a cell division. So with cell division, we have mitosis and cytokinesis. And then if we're kind of going through in a clockwise fashion here, this would be D1 or growth 1S and G2, growth and preparation for cell division. So what we're focusing on with DNA replication is S, which does stand for synthesis. It is the duplication of the DNA. It is the replication of the DNA. And it is necessary prior to cell division, whether it is mitosis or meiosis. Now, kind of keep in mind, this is kind of a huge process when we're talking about the human chromosome. So we know, of course, throwing the numbers out, that there are 46 chromosomes. Split up amongst the 46 chromosomes, we have the building blocks of DNA, the nucleotides, the base pair, and on the human 46 chromosomes, it is 3.2 billion of the base pairs. I'll just put it as these for the base pairs that we do have, which means we need to multiply this number by two. So 6.4 billion nucleotides that need to be available to the cell inside S of the cell cycle before we can even go ahead and replicate the DNA. We've already um, talked about the structure of DNA, so the DNA double helix, the complementary base pairing, as we see here, the A with the T, the G with the C, and this, of course, was the work of James Watson and Francis Crick going back to 1953 and the publishing of their work in Nature, and work in which, of course, they did receive the Nobel Prize for as well. I'm just going to quote for you one of the very last things that they did say in their original paper in Nature Journal. They said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Now considered to be kind of an understatement, but this is what they're really saying. Well, we know that what's holding the two sides together here, the base pairs, are hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are relatively weak, so they can be broken. And once they are broken, well, what we now get are the separation of them, and these are now templates. So once we do separate them, well, what we do know is that the only thing that can attach to this A is a T. The only thing that can attach to this C is a G, and so on and so on. So once you do separate them, once you do have these templates, this is what they were kind of getting at. So now if we do bring in all of those complementary bases, well, we end up with two copies of the DNA, whereas we started with one. So this is a very, very simple diagram, which is showing this replication process. Again, really simplified here. Again, keep in mind, we only have one, two, three, four, five base pairs. But when we're talking about the human chromosomes, the 46, the 3.2 billion steps, it's kind of a monumental task in order to get through and replicate the DNA. Uh, they do use these two different colors, the shading here as well, in our replicated DNA that I want to talk a little bit about. This is kind of significant shading that we do have. So if we take a look at the two, and they do call them here the daughter DNA molecules, the original one is the parent. And what we do see that out of the two ones that are formed, half of each one of these is actually made up of the original strand. The other half, 
this here is entirely new. So these would be the complementary nucleotides that are coming in once we separate the strands that are now going to be building this new strand, completely new strand of DNA. So let's take a look at this uh, first little bit of an animation that I have for you here that we'll talk a little bit about as it's going through. Again, it's starting off fairly simple. So we're taking our double-stranded DNA, we're separating it. We'll see that it's not quite this simple. It's not the entire thing that separated the entire chromosome at one time. But what we do have is the complementary bases that are coming in, the later shade blue that we have. And we started with one strand, and now we have two. Here it's showing a longer section of the DNA. So here they're talking about these different numbers, a five prime and a three prime. It doesn't look like I can write on here. Don't worry too much about these numbers, the five prime and the three prime. Once this animation is over, I'll chat a little bit about what they are referring to. But for biology 30, you don't exactly need to understand what the five prime and three prime are referring to. So it's showing that we've opened up the DNA, in fact, here in two different locations. And we have replication that's taking place. What is kind of important that we'll come back to is that there is a direction. Notice that for the top strand, after we've opened up the DNA, we're making the new DNA going to the left. And the one at the bottom, it's being made going to the right. Okay, and there's our two strands that we uh, that we do have. So I did mention I'd say just a little bit about the five prime and the three prime ends. And I just need a little bit of space here. Why don't I go to this one? So the five prime and the three prime, what it is referring to is the ribose sugar molecule. So I'm going to draw, um, which in fact is a fairly simple diagram of the ribose, so it is a five-sided sugar molecule. And within this five sides, we have four carbons and we have an oxygen, and then we have another carbon that is sticking up here. So the ribose is referring to the five different carbons. We do number these carbons, and this one here is our carbon number one, this is our carbon number two, our carbon number three, our carbon number four, and our carbon number five. So it's this one here, carbon number one, where we do have the hydrogen bond. And that's the one that's going to be attaching it to, um, or sorry, this is the one that's not the hydrogen bond, but it's the one that's going to be attaching it to the different nitrogen bases, that carbon. The other two are in the backbone. So the five prime and the three prime. This is the one prime, the two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. So the three and the five, they are in the backbone. So this one here would then attach to the five prime carbon of the next nucleotide down below. And this one here would attach to the three prime carbon on the nucleotide up above. So the only reason why I'm trying to explain this right now is because they do show it in a number of the different animations, and it really has to do with the directionality. So if they're talking about the three prime to five prime direction, it's in this direction. If they're talking about the five prime to three prime, then it would be going in the opposite direction. So just understand that it all has to do with the directionality of the DNA. Remember that the two strands, they are anti-parallel. So one of them is red in this direction. The other one is red in the opposite direction. One of them will be made, the new strand made in one direction. The other one will be made going in the opposite direction. So not only are these strands parallel, but they are anti-parallel in terms of the actual reading of the DNA and the writing or the making of the new strand. So 
So where we did C, now with this previous one here, where out of the two daughter DNA molecules that are formed, it's made up of half of it that is the old or original strand, the other half that is new. So in other words, half of each new daughter or DNA molecule is new, half of it is old. And what term that we use for that is conserved. Half of it is conserved, the other half is entirely new. And the prefix for half is semi. So the form of replication in which DNA is replicated is referred to as semi-conservative DNA replication. So this just shows the three different possible models. A conservative, here we see that after the first replication, we have one that is entirely made up of the original strand, the other one that is entirely new, and that one is wrong. The one at the bottom, the dispersa model, we can see that after the first replication, each one, each one of the strands, in fact, is half of the old and half of the new. That's the dispersa model. That one is wrong. You should know the name then. The one that is correct is the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. And you should be able to take a look at a picture like this and recognize that, yes, this is the correct one, the correct model for DNA replication. We saw something like that, uh, like this in the first animation. So if we were to start for each one of the chromosomes only at one end, open it up and replicate going in this direction and this picture here, possibly going from the left to the right, it would take a long, long time in order to replicate all 3.2 billion of those bases. So in fact, there are multiple replication points within or along the length of each one of the chromosomes. So where we do open up the DNA up and begin a replication, that is referred to as the origin of replication. So on this particular chromosome, what we have are one, two, three different origins of replication. So what does that mean? Well, we open it up, we create a bubble, which is now called a replication bubble, and that replication bubble is going to open up going in both directions. So at each end of the replication bubble, this is all the terminology that goes along with understanding replication, we have a replication fork. So replication or origin of replication is where you start to break the hydrogen bonds. The bubble is when it opens up. Replication forks are going in opposite directions at either end of the replication bubble. So because we are opening up at various different lengths along the DNA, this greatly enhances the rate at which DNA replication is going to be taking place. Eventually, all these bubbles are just going to merge together. We bring in all of the complementary bases, and we end up with our two strands of identical DNA molecules where we started with the one. Let's take a look at one more animation here showing us these origins of replication. So here, long length of the chromosome, but again, they're just going to zoom in on this one section in the middle. So one of the replication bubbles, the replication fork opening up, going to the left and going to the right. We'll get into all the details, but we're automatically just seeing the complementary bases that are being brought in in order to uh, form the two daughter molecules from the one that we started with in the first place. Again, it's not just at one location, it's at multiple different origins of replication. And here we can nicely see three different bubbles. Eventually they're all merging together and completely forming two identical DNA molecules. And similar to what we did see in that previous animation. So the terminology, again, the replication bubble, the replication fork, we already talked about those. Four different enzymes that you need to know about in terms of DNA replication. This is the first kind of big one here. It is helicase, so we'll talk a fair amount about what the helicase is doing. So it's the one that's going to untwist the DNA double helix and it's going to break the hydrogen bonds. A couple of other ones that I've put in here as well. You don't need to know it for bio 30, but it is in a couple of the animations. Single strand binding protein just keeps the template strands separated because they do have a tendency to just snap back together when the hydrogen bonds are broken. And something called topoisomerase is going to prevent the overwinding of the DNA as the DNA helicase is unwinding it and allowing for the breaking 
of the hydrogen bonds. So we'll take a look at a series of pictures here showing just one section of the replication. So this would be one of the replication forks that we're taking a look at here. And again, we do sort of have the five prime and the three prime ends that are identified. So if we take a look at the bottom strand, it will be a five prime at one end, and it'll be a three prime at the other end, and just completely flip around for the other complementary strand. So this is the enzyme that we're talking about right here, the helicase. So where we find it is right in the region of the replication fork. So it is at the replication fork. Again, it is unwinding the DNA, and it is breaking the hydrogen bonds right in here between the complementary bases. The second enzyme, it's identifying here as well. It is called a primase. And what it is going to lay down is a temporary RNA. RNA is a little bit different than DNA. It has a different sugar. And you need a short kind of primer, usually somewhere in the order of five to eight bases. And this is necessary before the third enzyme is going to come along. So this is enzyme number one. We'll review this again several times. This is enzyme number two in terms of the ones that you need to know about. And that sort of lays the groundwork or the RNA primer for the third enzyme. So the third enzyme is going to be this one right here. This is really kind of the big one, the DNA polymerase. And it is the one that's going to bring in the complementary nucleotide. Again, nucleotide is made up of sugar, the deoxyribose sugar, phosphate, and our nitrogen base. So DNA, it's DNA that we are making. Polymerase means that it is an enzyme. ASC, again, is an enzyme. And what it's going to make is a polymer. And it is a polynucleotide, a whole bunch of the nucleotides that are all being joined together. And that's what the DNA polymerase is going to be doing. So if we take a look at the picture here, this is our template strand that we have in the dark shade. DNA is read in the three prime to five prime direction. So we're starting at the top, and we're reading this dark strand going toward the bottom. That's the direction that the DNA is made in. DNA polymerase can only bring in complementary bases in the five prime to three prime direction. Again, don't be overly concerned about memorizing something like that. Just kind of realize that there is a specific direction that the DNA polymerase does have to work in. So what this DNA polymerase has already done is it's already brought in a complementary A, a complementary C, a complementary G, and now it's bringing in for this A, the complementary T. But notice that here there are three phosphates. In this sense, it's kind of like ATP. Remember, that's the universal energy source. This is an energy requiring process, and by cleaving off, by breaking off this last phosphate, that in fact is going to provide the energy in order to form the covalent bond this phosphate right here and this oxygen here. Okay, so we're going to form a bond right there. And if we shift over to the right-hand side, that bond that we're going to be taking a look at is in the backbone right in here. All right, so that's what our DNA polymerase is doing. And then it's just going to move on to the next one. Take a look at the next base of C and bring in the complementary D or guanine nucleotide. Or that one. This just explains again that antiparallel nature and a little bit about five prime and the three prime, the specific directionality. Uh, this picture here, this is where we get into a few more details because it's a little bit different at the replication fork in terms of the two different strands that we have, the two different templates. So what I've been showing pictures of so far is what's referred to as the leading strand. So that's the easier one that we'll talk about here, first of all. So we've already seen these pictures. We've already seen that this here is our first enzyme. This is the ligase. We've already seen this enzyme here, nope, number two. That's our primer, just this little bit that we have in red. And the DNA polymerase. And that's our enzyme number three. So as we do have this going to the left, so the DNA helicase is prying open the DNA double helix, it's unraveling it, 
that's allowing now the DNA polymerase to continue to move into, and that is the key is it's moving into the replication for it. Again, this polymerase, it can only write the DNA, make the DNA going in one direction, and that is from the five prime to the three prime end. Oh, sorry about that, the wrong number that I, it's going to be reading from the three prime to the five prime, it's gonna be writing from the five prime to the three prime. That is the only direction that it can work in. So let's take a look at an animation here, which is showing us the making of the leading strand. Again, this is going to be going into the replication fork. So they're showing us the entire bubble here, first of all, that has already been opened up. Remember that at each one of these replication bubbles, we have two different replication forks. And in this animation, they're just gonna show us what's going on on the right-hand replication fork, which of course is opening up going toward the right. So now we have two different templates. We have the upper template and we have the lower template. But remember that the information is going in opposite directions. So for one of the strands, it's going to be made going into the replication fork, and that is what we call the leading strand. And in this animation, that's the one at the bottom. So before you can have the DNA polymerase bringing in the complementary nucleotides, you need to have the primer, and that's what the primase is for. Now we can see the third enzyme, the DNA polymerase, that's just bringing in the complementary bases. So as it grows in toward the replication fork, the helicase is just going to unravel that DNA, double-stranded DNA even more, and the DNA polymerase just continues to grow into the replication fork and bring in the complementary bases. So that one, even though it sounds sort of complicated, that is the easier of the two. And um, this picture here just kind of takes us through the entire sequence of what is going on with, um, oh, sorry, this one here is the lagging strand that we're already going on to. So again, the one that I was showing in the animation, the one that it has in this picture, that is the one that's showing in the box and that is the leading strand. So the next series that we're going to take a look at are the ones that are the lagging strand. So what's different about this one is, well, remember once again, that the DNA polymerase can only work in one direction. So for the upper strand, the DNA polymerase is working going from the origin of replication into the replication fork on the left-hand side. But for the other strand, it's going to be going in the opposite direction. So what that means is that for the leading strand, we only need one primer right at the origin of replication. But for the so-called lagging strand, the one that's going away from the replication fork, as we open up the replication fork, we're going to need more and more primers because the DNA polymerase can only work going away from the replication fork. Okay, so let's take a look at the series that we have here. So this first picture, what we do have is the primase enzyme. This is our RNA primase. And it is bringing in the short section, which is going to make the double-stranded section, only it's not DNA, it's sort of this blending between the DNA and the RNA. So why you need this is because the enzyme DNA polymerase can only work where you have a double-stranded section. So this is all the temporary measure. Later on, we'll see it's going to be removed, but you have to have this short, short section that's double-stranded in order for the DNA polymerase to function. So now that we do have the DNA polymerase that is filling in this gap here, filling in all the complementary bases, now we've opened up the replication for a little bit more and of course, in this picture here, it's going to the left. So as we open it up a little bit more, what that means is we need another primer. And then we need the DNA polymerase to go away from the replication fork, going from one direction and only one direction. And for the lagging strand, that's going away from the replication fork. So now what we end up having 
are these segments of double-stranded DNA. So lowercase ds is for double-stranded. We do have our double-stranded DNA that we have formed here. But remember that those red lines, that is the RNA. And now what we need to do is we need to eventually get rid of those red sections, which is the RNA, and join together the sections of the DNA. So these segments of the DNA, it's kind of behind my print here, but it is the, or my line, but it, they are called the Okazaki fragment. So here we have two of the Okazaki fragments, which eventually we need to join together after we remove the primer. So in this picture, second from the bottom, we have our fourth enzyme. So we have our helicase that's unwinding the DNA. It's not shown on this picture. Then we have our primase that's putting down the short RNA primer. Then we have our DNA polymerase. After you remove these primers, you need to join together the Okazaki fragments. And that is now going to be the fourth enzyme that's not labeled here, but it is called DNA ligase. So now we have all four of the enzymes that you need to know for the process of replication. And in order, it is the helicase, the primase, the polymerase, and finally the ligase. So that was the lagging strand. Just some bigger pictures showing the same thing. So let's take a look at um, an animation of this, of the lagging strand, just like we did with the leading strand. So we have our green blob at the right hand side, that's our DNA helicase. It's showing at the bottom that that was our leading strand, and it's showing an arrow for the direction for the DNA polymerase and for the making of the DNA. So for that complementary strand, the one at the bottom, it's drawing into the replication fork. And now they're going to focus on the one at the top, which is for the lagging strand. So we can see the primer here in red, right by where it has the five prime. And again, yes, notice that it's going in the opposite direction. So now we have this huge gap between the five prime and the DNA helicase. Oh, so now we need to have another primer. We fill in this little bit of a gap between the two primers, and that's called an Okazaki fragment. As the helicase unravels the DNA a little bit further to the right, we would in turn need another primer, and we would have another Okazaki fragment. So eventually those primers, as it shows, they are removed, and the gaps need to be filled in, forming a bond between the adjacent sugars and phosphates, and that again is going to be the role of that last of the enzymes, which is the DNA ligase. In the box here, it's just showing it a little bit more magnified, where we have our short primer. <clears throat> this is now our DNA polymerase. Now that it has a short section that is double-stranded, only then can it begin to work. Bringing in the complementary bases, lagging strand, going away from the replication fork. We need to start again with another primer. DNA polymerase, bringing in the complementary bases, filling in that space between the two primers now. RNA is not what we want, we want DNA. So there is another version of DNA polymerase. You don't need to be concerned about the different kinds, but eventually that primer is removed. That's what it's showing here now. And the correct DNA nucleotides are brought in. And then this is the final enzyme, the DNA ligase, which is just going to join those Okazaki fragments together by forming a bond between adjacent sugars and phosphates. <clears throat> So really nice picture here, I think anyway, that uh, shows everything that we just talked about. So leading strand at the top, this is the one that's going into the replication fork. This is the one that can be made continuously. So there would be a primer. The primer would be in behind this picture here, where we would have just one single primer. Lagging strand at the bottom, again, a little bit more complicated. So kind of think of it this way, let's start 
at the replication fork where we have the helicase that's unwinding the DNA. As soon as you unwind it, this is our enzyme number one, you need the primer, and it's the primase that puts down the primer. I just needed to stop it momentarily there. Um, yeah, so our second enzyme, the primase, and then we have our polymerase that's bringing in the complementary DNA bases. And this is kind of nice because we can see that, well, now we have um, another Okazaki fragment and another Okazaki fragment here. So all different stages. So way over at the right-hand side, we've completely removed the primer, and now we have the last enzyme, the DNA ligase that's joining together. It's a little bit of a gap here, segments in the backbone. So order of the enzymes going from left to right, it is the helicase, and then it is the primase, and then the third one is the DNA polymerase, and the fourth one then is going to be the DNA ligase. We'll just take a look at a few more animations just to kind of summarize this process, hopefully it's coming clear, even though, again, there are a lot of details that you need to know. <clears throat> Double-stranded DNA. So this one here, they're calling initiation. So here we have the opening up, the unraveling of the DNA, the breaking of the hydrogen bonds, and that's the role of that first enzyme, the DNA helicase. Again, it shows it here, and I mentioned that it'll show this in the animations, single-strand binding proteins, but you don't need to know about that. And here we have our replication bubble from one original origin of replication, multiple replication bubbles along the length of the DNA, and two replication forks with each one of those. So this is going to take us on to the next stage then. A little bit of a different animation, but this is our replication bubble, focusing in on the replication fork on the left-hand side. As it says here, showing us the leading strand, there's the DNA polymerase, but it can't do anything because it can't work where we have single-stranded DNA. So it's just kind of hanging out, waiting until there is a double-stranded section. And that's why DNA polymerase isn't enzyme number two, but it's the RNA primase. So this is the primase that we see here now. It needs to put down a short double-stranded section that will later be removed because this is RNA and not DNA. But now that we do have that short double-stranded section, now the DNA polymerase is good to go and it can bring in the correct DNA nucleotides. Again, this is the leading strand, so it's showing it going into the replication fork. And a couple of other ones that we'll take a look at here as well. <clears throat> so kind of follow along at the left-hand side, which is showing the much longer section of DNA. And at the right-hand side, it's going to give us a list of different enzymes. So helicase is unwinding and breaking the hydrogen bonds. There's our primase. It's bringing in the short primer, and we saw the DNA polymerase as well. Way over at the right-hand side, we can see multiple replication bubbles that are eventually all merging together. So what it's showing here in the yellow, those are the RNA, not the DNA, so we need to remove those. And then we have these little gaps between the Okazaki fragments. Eventually, we need to seal out those gaps. So in terms of this list that we have here, it's really just the helicase the primase, the polymerase, and the ligase that we need to know about. Let's do one more. <clears throat> so 
this is our DNA. It's not showing it in the twisted double helix. It's just showing sort of the irregular straight ladder. But again, we have all of the enzymes along the bottom here. So this one here, the green rectangle, that would be our helicase, it looks like. Red is going to be our primase, bringing in the short primer. Blue is going to be our polymerase. Top strand is going into the replication fork. That's our leading strand. One at the bottom is going to be the lagging strand where we're going to have some Okazaki fragments. So one at the top, again, it was made continuously. One at the bottom, we have two primers and there would be many, many other primers. So now we have an Okazaki fragment in the middle here. We need to remove those primers. Just a different DNA polymerase that removes the primers. And finally, just these little nicks in the backbone that we need to seal off. And that's the role of the last enzyme, which is the helicase, semi-conservative DNA replication. So this is a process, keep in mind, where you have 3.2 billion of these steps in the human DNA, and you want to make this as um, accurate as you possibly can. So you have a proofreading mechanism, and really proofreading is just DNA polymerase that's going back, double-checking, and make sure there isn't a mismatch. So all kinds of things can result in mutations, which is changes to the correct DNA base sequence. Um, exposure to, well, things like chemicals and radioactive radiation, x-rays, ultraviolet radiation. All of these can cause uh, mutations or changes. If there is a mistake, again, the proofreading enzymes, they should come along and will do exactly this. So what this picture is showing is that right in here, there is a mismatch. So you want to remove where that mismatch is. You want to have the DNA polymerase bringing in the correct one the backbone and then repairing any mistakes. So we'll take a look at a really, really simple animation that's showing this process. But again, the proofreading is once again just the uh, DNA polymerase as it shows here. So right underneath the level of the DNA polymerase is where we're going to have the mismatch. And it's where that mismatch is, that's coming in now. That, that needs to be recognized, that it's not the correct base. So of course, complementary to a T is the A, not the C. So that incorrect one, is going to be cut out. So where they say exonuclease, that is going to be the cutting and removal of that incorrect nucleotide. And then the DNA polymerase is going to essentially bring in the correct one. So this is the proofreading mechanism to ensure that there are very, very few mistakes when the DNA is replicated. And finally, at the ends of the DNA, this does create a little bit of a problem for the DNA polymerase. And that is because of the fact that there is a specific direction, of course, that the DNA polymerase can feed the DNA and bring in the complementary bases. So this is the problem. When we do get to the ends of the chromosomes, it's the lagging strand. So we know that right at the end, in order for the DNA replication to take place, we do need to have the primer. But right at the end of the chromosome where you have that primer, now we have, well, no way to actually fill in these, whatever it is, five to eight bases every time the DNA replicates. So what that means is that with every replication, the ends of the chromosomes get chopped off. With every replication, the chromosomes get shorter and shorter. So the story goes, and depending upon what source you go to, is it's between 50 and 80 rounds of DNA replication. And after this many rounds of DNA replication have been taken place, there is so much of the DNA at the end that has been chopped off 
that that cell can no longer divide anymore. That DNA can no longer be replicated. So the ends of the chromosomes, when we're talking about eukaryotic cells, they are referred to as the telomeres. So these telomeres at the end, they don't actually prevent the shortening, but what they do is they kind of, well, buy a little bit of time. So within the telomeres, there is no coding information. So some of this information can be chopped off, but eventually it reaches a point where it does get into the coding information. So as I have here, some indication that this is, well, possibly what is related to the actual process of aging. So this is not the case in uh, germ cells. So germ cells are stem cells within a body. So think about early embryonic development. There are cell divisions that are going to be taking place that will allow for many more than 50 to 80 cell divisions. And it's a little bit different because in germ cells, in stem cells, they have an enzyme which is called telomerase. So it is turned on in these cells. And what that means is that when we do have a chromosome here, and if we do have the end that's chopped off, telomerase somehow allows that to be restored. So that means that these kind of cells, they can continue to, to divide, well, for the most part, indefinitely. So shortening of the telomeres, um, some indication as well that this might actually protect against cancerous growth, and there is evidence that telomerase activity in cancer cells is what actually allows those cancer cells to persist. So cancer cells um, can continue to divide, like stem cells, they can continue to divide for the most part indefinitely if they are provided with nutrients, because somehow they have these magical abilities to be able to turn on this telomerase enzyme. <clears throat> 